So I'm a, a little bit about FIFA Consulting. We've got a team of consultants situated in most capital cities uh, across Australia. Um, we also lead the Health and Safety Index, which is an online survey. Throughout the, the series, we'll, we'll share with you some of our learning um, in and around safety contractor management, um, and also some of our, our results around the Health and Safety Index as it, as it relates to contractor management as well. Um, before we sort of get stuck into it, and I'll hand the next slide over to, to Ben in a second to just introduce what we're talking about. It's probably worth just thanking Ben. Um, Gamuda has just been awarded a, a, about a $2 billion contract with Sydney Metro. So um, Ben's as busy as ever. So for him to take time out today is, is really appreciated. So thanks, mate. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, so I guess um, uh, you know today's today's session is uh, is one of five um, uh, five components, um, and I'd, I'd thank uh, like to thank Myosh and, and obviously um, FIFO for having me along to share some insights on contractor safety. It can be quite a difficult area sometimes uh, trying to navigate, um, you know, particular requirements uh, either set by contracts or or with internally, um, you know, in a, within organisations. But I think today's session is around some of the challenges that we face, you know, around selecting and engaging contractors. Um, how we, I guess, segment or, or determine and differentiate contractors um, from one another. Um, because, you know, some have got various lengths of time on site or, or not. And it's about um, providing the right amount of governance at the, at the, right, uh, the right time. Um, obviously, the selection process can, some, um, can, can be a very um, worthwhile process um, if it's done properly. Um, on the flip side, it can agitate contractors in, in and around the inconsistencies about how that's applied um, and, uh, and, and, you know, for what level of um, contractor do you prescribe um, an evaluation process to, to a full extent and, and or um, to a lesser extent. So we'll talk through that. Um, of course, how do you uh, then engage and, and pre-qualify uh, around some of those agreements? So we'll give you a bit of a feel for um, what good looks like and, uh, and share some um, stories uh, about how that, uh, how that plays out in practice. So we've got a bit of a, a poll here, Sarah. Are you able to um, facilitate that for us? Thank you. So the question is, um, is it a legal requirement for principal contractors to collect subcontractor worker qualifications? So for example, the, the construction white cards. So a, a simple yes, no response and be very interesting to understand uh, what people's thoughts are around this. Often pretty controversial around how far you go in terms of collating records of your, your subcontractors. And Ben, as we're sort of waiting for the results to come through, have you um, had much experience in debating this particular question? Yeah, I think I think what governs it um, in terms of the, the, the information that you take is it, it sort of crosses the boundary of what you what you obtain, I suppose, from a legal standpoint, um, and then what's reasonably practicable to know um, using some of the WHS language um, in, in the laws around, well, how do you demonstrate that you know that someone is you know, qualified? And usually um, the checking and verification of, of that information um, may end up um, you know, having, having records and being able to demonstrate that throughout audits or, or inspections by regulators and the like. So Sarah, it's almost um, a split decision. We've got 67% um, saying yes, it is a legal requirement and 33% saying, saying no. So um, th this actual question is, I guess, symbolic of where we're at in terms of contractor management for many. Um, it's super great in many areas. And if you sit on the fence, you can say it's all about risk um, and not being really clear I guess what we're trying to do today is provide a bit more clarity on how you can make these sort of decisions and justify that based on risk mm -hmm. with a few prompters, a bit of a framework, um, so you can start to justify any sort of decisions that you make either way. Um, I guess um, from a personal point of view, I guess my thinking around this is um, depending on the nature of the risk and the complexity of the project uh, and the risk appetite of your business, you know, arguably, if you do the right work up front around um, segregating WHS obligations, setting clear expectations on ownership, um, 
you know, you can legally um, set some expectations without necessarily collating a whole lot of records. Mm. Um, on the flip side, though, if you know you, you, you do have a, a pretty low threshold for risk um, and the complexity of the job deems it necessary, um, well, you might see it, um, a requirement for your organisation to go that step further. Um, but we can talk about that and debate that further as we go through with other examples today. So in terms of the, the challenges, what we intend on doing for the, throughout the five um, part series is we're going to provide different pieces of data research just to reinforce some of the challenges that we're hearing um, across stakeholders and industry around contractor management. Um, from my experience developing and auditing management systems and working with organisations um, as a consultant, but also having worked in-house for the likes of Rio Tinto, um, managing some of their major contracts, um, contractor management and procurement, safety around procurement often is considered to be um, one of the more complex matters um, of a management system and systems of work. And I guess some of the stats you're seeing on the, the screen here sort of depict that too. Um, so there was some work done by the Australian Council of Superannuation Investors a couple of years ago now, um, and, and they reported that um, of the fatalities in the top um, 200 ASX, 70% of those were contractors. Um, just to give an indicator of you know, some of the, the magnitude of the challenges industry has. Um, to support that, there's also an industry um, journal article um, published by Valu um, or written by, authored by Valu, Ray and Decker um, in 220. And it tried to depict some of the contributing factors around or well, why is contractor management such a, a challenge? Um, and the four areas that they called out were variability of work. So often contractors are, are called in not to do the same work all the time, but it, it can vary from time to time, particularly given the nature of contracting is that you often call them in to do some specialist short-term activity, um, which isn't your core business. Um, so it's also probably worth um, calling out as we talk about variability of work is that by managing contractors well, it can actually be a, a fantastic competitive advantage for organisations in terms of getting a good return on investment. Um, so there's a reason why um, organisations contract out work because it actually can be really beneficial um, despite its challenges. Um, the other, the second contributing factor around some of the challenges was the communication from top layers. So often with larger organisations, there's lots of layers between um, what happens around decision makers all the way through the organisation and then down the supply chain, uh, particularly if uh, contractors and subcontract out work, um, the message often gets diluted. Um, through to the, the frontline operator. Um, third one, the expertise of work versus safety. So, you know, often subcontractors or contracting organisations are selected based on their, their technical expertise, not necessarily on their safety expertise. And, and, and often they're two very different things. Um, so as we walk through some of the pre-qualification and selection um, discussions today, it might just be work thinking around how your organisation selects um, pre-qualifiers, engages your contractors based on their safety capability and just not their work technical capability. Um, and also monitoring that, of course. Um, and, and the fourth one being time pressures and um, cutting corners. So uh, we'll share some health and safety index data around this um, in um, some of the webinars to come. We're finding it's a pretty consistent message based on the data and the benchmark data that we have too, is that um, often contractors are called in to do short term work at speed. Um, and often it's a fixed dollar contract. So, you know, it's in their best interest to zip in and zip out relatively quickly. Um, so it's that balancing act between getting the commercial um, drivers right and the impact that has on, on behaviours as well. Um, and Ben, I know that you've worked with you know a number of different tier one contractors. Do those sort of contributing factors resonate with your experience as well? Uh, yeah, they do, and I think it's important. Um, I think the next slide actually goes into a little, you know, sh shed some light on on that detail. Um, and it's really about you know um, um, we'll come back to that slide, but I think the next one is around types of contractors. So the 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 fundamental um, 
you know, idea is that you've got contractors that are there at various time frames and, and for various durations, right? Some are major subcontracts, some are minor, some are minor subcontracts. And I think I think the ability to influence um, or organisations' um, outcomes, um, I think there lies in the, the type of contract uh, that's in place and, and the right level, as you, as you said, you know, commercial drivers to, to get to a point of evaluation. So you think of, you know, labour hire, you've got permanent and or um, short or, or, or part-time um, works. I think you've got consultants that play a part generally as a service, um, independent contractors, uh, principal contractors themselves, um, you know, what, what's the requirement even, you know, from a head contract to those contractors, I think has a, has a, a bearing on the type of um, evaluations that get done. Um, and then you've got, um, you know, uh, that, 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 that from my experience, the often one that gets missed and most of the investigations, uh, health and safety investigations that we've done and worked backward to work out whether you know a governance process has worked um, from from an onboarding of uh, you know of contractors in the beginning, has always um, nine times out of ten revealed that down the line contractors that is a, a sub subcontractor of perhaps companies that you might have a contract with. Um, the information that we share with those contractors is often met is often left. So that, you know, so, and what I mean by that is if Mark is my contractor, I provide all my, my information to Mark very, um, very specifically and uh, they understand the terms and conditions. Uh, Mark gets him, finds himself in a position where he can't deliver that work, um, you know, in, in, in sort of, um, you know, fully complete that work himself. So then he shares that with the down the line contractor and the same level of rigour. Uh, an evaluation that I've done with Mark's organisation um, isn't isn't perhaps the same due diligence that's done with down the line contractors, and that's sometimes where um, some of those gaps uh, and cracks appear in, in in this process. So, um, from experience, uh, that's that's certainly one to watch. Yeah, great. And look, um, Ben, what we often do with organisations when we're helping them with contractor management, um, and it's something that the, 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 the people in the core might think about they want to do themselves is. You know, where are you at the moment today around your current state on contractor management and, and what's your desired state? Are you actually managing contractors effectively? Um, so we provide different assurance activities to help organisations understand where they're at um, versus where they want to be, um, which is sort of depicted on the screen there around some of the outputs of the assurance activity that we typically provide. Um, and you can see there, um, it sort of mirrors the, the, the five um, webinars that we're going to be going through over the next few weeks. So Ben referred to the different types of contractors. Um, and I think um, as we start thinking about um, setting expectations around the level of um, involvement, how far we want to go, often it comes down to ownership of and roles around who does what. Um, and the level of control and influence you, you, you wish to provide on the particular organisation and or individuals. So often with labour hires, and this is just an example, um, you know, being a, a, a labour hire company, um, you, you're an, the labour hire employee, the direct employee of yours that you're often putting onto a host employer site. So the level of control and influence around how they do go about doing their work is relatively high. I know that the host employer obviously has a pretty big role. Um, so that control and influence and the way that you manage and the, the records that you would obtain and the training that you would provide is very different to engaging a, an independent contractor or a consultant uh, to come in and do a, a small piece of work that might be relatively low risk. Um, and to be frank, you, you probably don't want to be directing them how they do their work anyway. Um, Principal contractors, and, and Ben, you've got a huge amount of experience here too, often that can vary as well. So you, you might have an asset owner, a superannuation fund, who has got some obligations still um, around the engagement of contractors and um, the, the, the facilities themselves in terms of the, the asset itself being safe and the work environment. How far a superannuation fund goes and the, the directors on a superannuation fund could be very different um, based on their risk profile and their level of influence control versus um, transport for New South Wales, um, which um, from experience tend to go a little bit further. Um, is that fair to say, Ben? Yeah, I think so. And I think, I think they vary in terms of the maturity of what they expect 
um, a principal contractor, uh, you know, to, to have and, and, and live up to. Um, and there's, a, there's probably a little bit of variation there around, um, you know, the, the, the um, information that gets requested from the PC um, or principal contractors to establish that position uh, even before you start tendering, um, which I think is, uh, is pretty clear up, up front uh, from, from my experience. Yeah. Yeah, great. Well, look, um, let's zip through. Um, I'm mindful we need, need to spend a bit of time on uh, Q and A at the end, so we're going to have to zip through this pretty quick. Um, in terms of segmenting, so we we spoke about the different contractor types, um, the level of influence and control. Often, if you overlay that with the complexity of the work, the role, the risk, you can start to identify which subcontractors you you want to get more involved in. Um, reviewing records, directing traffic versus those that you want to exhibit less influence control over. So as mentioned earlier, um, if you spend the time up front to segment your contractors, um, often that reduces the administrative burden through the life cycle of the contract for you um, and also the supplier as well. So you know, it ends up being a bit of a win-win if you can do a bit of work up front um, and understand how you can make decisions based on risk. Yeah, I, th I think, yeah, I'll probably take this one, Mark, because I think this is important, right? So mm -hmm. when we're talking about subcontractor, and this is the beginning of those evaluations. So I think, as Mark kind of pointed out, I think it's, you've got to find the right time to, to conduct the evaluation. If, you, if you're talking about, you know, um, multiple um, vendors, multiple contractors, um, you know, being um, positioned for a, a tender for a package of work, um, I, I think in, at the beginning, um, it can be counterproductive to have them all go through an evaluation at the beginning because I think you need to establish um, probably a couple of factors and not just not just WHS that probably gets you to a short couple of few and that's from from my um, experience I learned is that if you start with perhaps five vendors maybe that's not the time to start evaluating them um, around around some of this WHS requirement I think if you get to a point where you think they've got the right capability. Um, you've got a bit of an indication of, of how they're going to perform um, from a you know commercial position, and then maybe you select a short few because um, then you're starting to get down into the into sort of the micro detail um, around around that. And I think that's probably the good um, a good segue to start evaluating their WHS um, requirements. And as 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 you can see in front of you, there's some more traditional um, 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 probably a, evaluation measures around injury rates, around how many prosecutions they may or may not have <clears throat> um, if they've got a, an ISO um, certification. Um, and I think some of those can probably add probably uh, you know probably minimal value as opposed to understanding <clears throat> you know what have they what have they done in the past, how have they managed to overcome those those challenges. Um, a good one that I've, I've um, often asked um, uh, is how do their senior leaders of their organisation um, engage with, with um, you know, um, with the workforce and, and the business to, to maximise um, work health safety outcomes. Uh, and, that, and that usually um, gives you a, a, you know, a, a good indication or measure around um, how operationally focused the, the senior leaders are of that organisation um, and uh, few and far between uh, do it well. Um, next slide, um, I think, goes into um, more around, you know, what, what are some of those pre-qualification um, uh, measures around, around using or using a risk-based approach. So you can ask the, 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 low, um, the low measuring indicators. Do you have a, you know, a swims process or not? Do you have an ability? Um, what's, how do you review those? Do you have a, um, a criteria that measures those outcomes? And this would vary, I think, from experience on whether they have, um, you know, an accreditation or, or, a, or a, um, a certification for that organisation. So most of you will be familiar with either the um, 45001 um, certification and or uh, the Office of the Federal Safety Commissioner uh, accreditation. And I think if you've, if you've got either one of those, um, the levels of um, um, organisational forms or processes that you would use would, would somewhat vary, um, you know, in terms of drilling down into more of a, a higher level um, evaluation outcome. Um, so, you know, a good example of that is if, uh, if, you, if you, as part of your evaluation, just check that they have a SWIMS process, that's one aspect. Um, but if you're probably more on the OFSC accredited end, um, you'd be able to demonstrate what the um, SWIMS review process is 
to then validate that they're probably a little bit more mature um, by design of, uh, of their accreditation. Uh, and then you get down through those other, other ones uh, and, and they're again, fairly self-explanatory to that example. Um, do they have a training system? Um, yes or no binary question and or what do those systems look like? Do you have a process for that? Um, is there a procedure? What do you benchmark against uh, and the like? So yeah, as Mark said before, depending on the risk appetite of that organization and perhaps the maturity of the safety management system that gets implemented, um, that would vary. But uh, I think they all lend themselves to probably a better pre-qualification outcome um, for contractors that uh, you have a bit more influence over and those that are, uh, are of a little bit more longer term um, for that for that contract and, and scope. Yeah, great. And look, um, a good example is, you know, I've worked with some organisations where they don't want to stick their nose in too far and review and retain records. So they've just asked the question, yes, no. And um, that's enough comfort for them um, and put the ownership back on the contractor and maintain the records. Um, and then they check that periodically through audit um, versus another organisation I'm working with at the moment um, a pharmaceutical organisation who is storing some pretty high grade drugs, um, very low risk appetite. They want to see police checks for um, certain positions and individuals. So they're drilling down really, really low because they just can't afford um, to um, suffer any sort of reputational risk if they don't go that step further in terms of the checks and balances. So again, it depending on the risk profile on how far organisations want to go. Yeah, I think I think the, I think the agreement the agreement stage I think is um, critical um, in in once you've kind of pre qualified and you have assessed that uh, vendor or contractor against a particular criteria, um, I think then the contracting terms would would vary based on um, the the impact of those works, whether it be long term or short form contracts, um, and that would obviously set the tone for perhaps what that legal standpoint is with that organisation or contractor. Um, what, what your expectation is around the roles and obligations of that contract that may vary. Um, the ability for, for performance outcomes and uh, incident expectations might vary also. You know, if, if Mark comes in and supports an organisation from a consulting lens and doesn't really step foot on the actual site or the operation, um, then therefore, you, you know, the, the, probably the incident management obligations for something that happens in Mark's office and the contribution for uh, the, the contract they may have when they're on site full time, um, would vary. So therefore, you know, it's, in, it's important we get the agreement right. I, I think the other thing that often gets missed and, and we'll probably open the floor for, for Q&A shortly, but I think the performance assessment ongoing is, is critical, right? So don't think that the prequal process with contractors kind of stops once you've issued the agreement because that from experience often gets, um, all right, we've, we've signed the contractor up, fantastic. How do you continually keep keep uh, check that they're, they're doing what they're doing? And, and this might sound um, probably cliche that you've got to continue to monitor the contractor, but often um, we do all this kind of great work up front to get to a position on a on a preferred contractor and the, the right um, organisation from an evaluation point of view. Uh, but then we kind of um, we fall short on the performance assessment, and and that could even be ongoing, or it could be at the end of their works. Um, and and majority of this stuff is is um, fairly standard in terms of ISO certification. But how do you make sure that the organisation is informed? Once that contract has completed their work, how do they how do they go? You know, what do they, how do they perform? Um, and reevaluate them against some of that criteria that you used at the start. And I think when we go to then go to market for the next time, um, then you've you've kind of already done a, a, a bit of insight or a bit of evaluation to say, well, we know that contractor can perform because they've done X, Y, Z for us previously. They perform really well, or conversely, they didn't they didn't do so well. Uh, perhaps we need to uh, invite a few others um, to sort of um, you know balance the scale. So uh, that, that also comes into consideration from a performance uh, uh, evaluation ongoing. Yeah, you're dead right, Ben. And look, the other watch out too at an agreement stage is often to set some expectations around engaging subcontractors um, and informing um, the contractor, the head contractor, when that occurs. Um, and obviously all of the uh, other requirements in and around that because um, you know, what, what you don't want to get yourself into as a head contractor is where you've got um, your contract is subcontracting our hard to work that you've got very little knowledge of um, and very little understanding of their contractor um, capability as well, which leaves everyone um, potentially exposed. So in terms of uh, another poll there, Sarah, and then we sort of get into um, some further information and Q&A. Um, the next question is based on today's discussion, um, 
And what did you find most valuable? Was it the, the discussion around the, the challenges contractors have um, or the other components that we spoke about from segmenting contractors up front, uh, the selection process all the way through to engaging, pre-qualifying and, and, and forming a, some form of agreement um, with your contractors? So really keen to, to get some feedback. Um, yeah, I'm just having a little bit of a problem launching the second poll um, with the software. So we can. Um, there's a question in the chat that I might be able to address, Sarah, and that can that could probably buy you some time. Uh, but yeah, uh, I think probably question for Mark. Will the slides become available? I can't comment on that one. Uh, but there's a question there from Dave Middleton. Um, thanks for your question, Dave. And his question um, is, is around, you know, what's the legal requirement for verifying competency um, for a person that is on a short-term labour hire uh, arrangement? And are they required to, um, you know, read all the company documents? It's a, it's a good question, I think. And it's a very live one um, for our organisation at the moment. Malaysian organisation now in Australia operating um, probably have, have had a lot of you know, self-performed work in the past. Now we're going to go to a more of a subcontractor um, and labour hire model. Um, and it, I think it varies. I think if you look at a high-risk work licence, um, you know, for, by, by a legal standpoint, and the poll uh, has just been put up. Thanks, Sarah. So based on today's um, conversation, uh, what was the most valuable learning? So select your... Um, your, your most relevant dot points there. But to further address David's question, I think if you've got a high-risk work licence and the, the labour hire holds that licence, then it's important to be able to understand what the validity of that, uh, you know, um, of, of that competency is. Um, and currently, the way that the industry does that is, is with a, you know, is with a, a secondary uh, or supplementary verification of competency. Um, so the answer would probably, Dave, I think from a governance point of view, um, is that, yeah, the labour hire might come um, trained and, and, and competent to do a particular work and that might be referenced by a ticket or a, or a license to operate if you're talking about plant. Um, but I think, yeah, I think the, the, the position for an organisation, if you're the principal contractor, is how do you, how do you determine current, um, you know, current currency of, of competency? The only way you do that is you, you verify it. All right. I hope uh, that answers your question. Okay, uh, this poll, uh, most people have answered, so I'll share the results. Alrighty, so we've got um, almost um, even for the first three, um, ranging from 15 to 23%, and the, the winner in terms of um, the most valuable learning from today is 1.4. So the engagement um, component um, around pre-qualifying and pulling together agreements. Um, so it's great. Uh, it's great to see that people are getting something out of today's session. Um, and I think um, th there's another there's another question there from Declan. I think, think before we wrap up, we'll acknowledge. And I think over the five part series, we'll probably get into a bit more detail, uh, perhaps around, you know, how we manage the down the line, down the line, down the line contractors. And it's always a, it's always a great question. Um, and I think it's, you know, we provide so much effort and energy with the contractor that we have immediate con um, contact with, as I was saying um, before, but I think it's how do we, how do we continue to make sure that those down the line contractors have the same message when we're probably a little bit more removed um, from that contractor. And I think it's, it's just uh, it's just making sure you get resilient um, in making sure and, and yes it's probably it's probably a bit of duplication but you've 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 got to continually make sure that they they given the same information um, that we give the, the contractors that they work for. So Sarah, I know we promised a short and sharp um, session of thirty minutes, so time's up. Um, there are a couple more slides with information that people can access. So when the slides do go out. Um, and they will be made available. Um, some additional information people can refer to at the back end of these slides um, and we can make that available to anyone on the call today. Um, so happy to sort of end things there, Sarah, if you wish. Um, equally, you know, if people want to hang around, happy to chat through any sort of additional questions that people might have as well. Okay, well, um, the, the chat is coming through the Q&A panel mainly and the questions are coming through the chat panel. So <laughs> <laughs> Try to um, so in the uh, poll says agrees the ongoing assessment is important as some contractors become really good tenderers with their staff for this role, um, never really understanding what they do in practice. 
Um, and Richards um, just wanted to uh, confirm, yes, the slides and the recording will be sent out either later today or tomorrow via email. Stay tuned to your spam folder as well, because sometimes those emails slip into there. And um, lots of chat, lots of thank yous. Obviously, very valuable today, guys. So um, there are a couple of questions in the chat if you want to um, answer those. Um, Jessica asks, um, a kind of contract to provide a certificate of currency for their insurances. However, it doesn't always tell the full story of what work they are insured to perform. How do you manage this? And to what degree do you review insurance policies rather than just the certificate of currency? It's a really, it's a really good question, particularly as it relates to the finer details of the policy and the value of the policy. Um, we're doing some work recently with an organisation, one contract that had a $20 million uh, professional indemnity insurance, sorry, public liability insurance, and the other one had two and a half thousand. Um, so I think what I generally do is I, I refer to the broker. I, often these insurance policies are administered through brokers and they can provide you a pretty quick response on the level of risk and coverage to, to support that based on the work that's being done. Um, if the contractor has no WHS management system but is good value, can it make can I make it part of my current system? Yeah, so um, I get this, asked this question a lot, particularly as it relates to SWIMS. If I give the contractor a SWIM, do I take on the liability? If you take a risk-based approach, um, I know some organisations think it's a bigger risk by not giving them a SWIM because yeah. um, particularly for um, when you're dealing with um, contractors of um, a, a low value, that might be you know, a sole trader or someone relatively small um, and the value of the contract's quite small, um, you know, that they, they think it's actually a, a better management of risk by giving them a, a their, their safe work benefit statement, working under their safe work benefit statement, but just being quite clear on how that work is directed. Um, so not ideal, clearly, um, but sometimes it's just based on risk. And if there's a commercial reality where you think they can do the job safely, um, and they're better off and safer with your safe work method statement. I, I actually see that happen quite often. I think it, I think it goes down to the you know the valuation. I mean, upfront you'd probably want to know how they manage their risks uh, and what sort of risk management system they use. And at that point, it'd be very obvious that they probably don't have a position. And uh, I would I would have some concern over selecting a contractor that doesn't have a risk management process uh, in this day and age, considering uh, the length of time that you know safe work method statements uh, have been around. Uh, the other thing I'd say on that is, um, you know, I think it'd be a, a way of a principal contractor discharging their obligations to a contractor by allowing to, to, them to work under that that safe work method statement with with an appropriate level of, of communication and consultation. I think that's uh, more than fair and reasonable um, uh, approach to, to managing health and safety for sure. Are there any more questions there, Sarah? Um... Just oh, there is a, a question that's come up a couple of times. What is the answer to the first poll? What is the, the, the answer? Um, yes. The correct answer. Yeah. <laughs> Look, there's, no, there's nothing in the legislation that says you have to. Um, notwithstanding that, um, having records can help demonstrate um, you're discharging your obligations. Um, you can also discharge those other ways, as we sort of mentioned throughout um, the webinar. If you're deeming the contract to be relatively low risk and not complex, and you're setting clear expectations up front um, around the contractor's role to have safe systems of work and that you will not be verifying and retaining those records, um, well, then it's, it's more than reasonable not to. Um, do you think that's fair, Ben? Yeah, yeah. I think I think um, a lot of the times, um, particularly when I've gone through previous accreditation audits, um, you know, for for the organisations that I've worked for, is um, as long as you've got a, a fairly valid um, check and verify process, um, and that could be that you've and you know you've you, you're detailing that you've checked and verified by citing the license, and and, it's, and it corresponds to the person. Um, that's showing you that license and you've got evidence around that. 
um, whereby you don't actually take a copy of that ticket or competency, um, then then that's okay. I think the other thing I'd say is in, in most instances, you know, if you're kind of getting, um, in, you know, if you're getting the okay by the person that's, um, that's that's presenting you those cards, do you mind if I, you know, um, take a copy of these or whatever and they and they decline? Well, then the check and verify process is valid, um, and those that agree, well, that's that's almost permission to um, to take them. But from a legal standpoint, as you said, um, there's no legal requirement to obtain those copies of those, uh, but uh, but it does yeah reinforce your due diligence uh, if you've got them on file um, if from from experience. Yep, and um, you know if if it is a low risk um, contract. Um, and you're setting those expectations up front, um, asking the question, that binary question, do you have systems of work? And they respond with um, a yes. Well, but for some organisations, that's enough without necessarily having to go through and actually do the role of the subcontractor um, in terms of maintaining their records. Yep. Uh, another question there from Delwyn. Um, swimmers are not relevant in the industry I am in. Um, do you view um, safe operating procedures and safe work procedures in the same manager um, manner for, for contract uh, engagement? Absolutely, yeah. Del, I'd say uh, one one hundred percent. You know, it's it's a it's a work instruction um, that identifies the correct way of um, of, of conducting an activity. Um, the only difference between an SOP and, and a, say, a safe work method statement is um, it probably has the same step by step approach. It probably doesn't go into the, the the determination of risk and controls. Perhaps controls it might, uh, but it probably won't. You know, identify um, risk. Um, um, but I, I would say, yeah, absolutely, mate. It's a set of instructions. Um, the, the the law says you've got to be able to provide instruction, competency, training, um, and then those documents are the key documents that that um, provide that level of rigor. So I'd say, yeah, absolutely. I would I would view them as the uh, um, as the same. Um, I have one more quick question from Katie, who says, who is the principal contractor if engaging a large construction company? Is the main contractor hiring all the subbies the principal contractor, or is the company hiring the main construction contractor the principal contractor legally? He has mixed thoughts on this all the time. I think it'd um, be good to get your view on this too, Ben, but it, it, it's about setting that expectation up front. Um, now, the reg talks about when a principal contract is required. So when you are setting up um, the, the work arrangements, it's about clearly articulating who is the principal and who's not. Um, simple as that. Yeah, and I, I think it's very, very clear. I mean, you know, if, 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 if um, I have the head contract, perhaps with a client, and I'm, I sit in the principal contractor role and I hire the subcontractors that are, that are below, uh, you know, the organisation that I work for in, the, uh, in that kind of hierarchy order, let's say it's Mark's business in this case, well, then I, 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 I'm the principal contract because I've got the head contract obligation. Um, does that remove any of Mark's obligation to discharge the requirements of the health and safety legislation? No, not at all. Um, he has to fulfil the same obligations as, uh, as the principal contractor does. Uh, but uh, yeah, in terms of setting the uh, direction um, and the obligations, I need to make sure that Mark's clear on those. Um, Camille, um, yeah, I agree, agree. A safe work um, procedure or SOP is not necessarily viewed as a swims um, and, they're, and they're, they're, they're separate. They're separate. Um, one's, one's a mechanism to fulfill obligations under the, under the act uh, and the regulation. The other is a set of instructions that doesn't necessarily have the same, um, you know, um, inputs and outputs as a, as a safe work method statement. Um, but, uh, but in terms of a, a set of instructions on how to operate something or, uh, or whatever they powerful uh, in, in tandem. All right. Um... Phil, one last question from Phil. If I note down a photograph, say a crane driver's license is it good to have, but he but if you have no personal crane qualifications to judge his or her skills, how do you cover this scenario? Uh, so, so I guess as a con if there, he's a contractor, um, you know, going through that um, pre-qualification process, um, verifying. Um, the crane driver's company's safe systems of work. Um, it's really up to the company to manage their own employees um, in terms of they've got the right skills, qualifications, experience. And your, your 
um, I guess, verifying and monitoring the company with the expectation that they then manage their employees accordingly. Yeah, I think, Phil, if you're in Australia, um, you know, there'd be a, a fixed position on high-risk work licences for crane operations, and that varies from, from one crane cl class to, an, to the next. And I think the legal position is if they've got a high-risk work licence to operate that classification of crane, then that should be your minimum um, um, approach to validating that competency. If they don't have that or you're outside of Australia, um, then you probably need to um, see what the regulator in that jurisdiction's position is on, uh, on on what and how they validate competency, um, and then that 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 would probably um, be a, probably a better um, probably source to obtain that information. Okay, um, I, there are a few more questions. I think I'll um, send them over to you, Mark. Maybe you can um, address them in an email, and we can put them through um, in the uh, email that we send out tomorrow. Um, so next week's topic is mobilising contractors safely, and that'll be presented by Laura Blampede um, in conjunction with Mark Wright, and Laura is the team leader for Scout Solutions, and it will outline methods to engage contractors prior to work commencing to ensure readiness. So hopefully um, it's the same link, same webinar series, so um, you'll probably get a reminder on the day or the day before in your email for that one. So um, is there anything else, um, gentlemen, or we wrap that up? Look, um, no, look, th thanks again, Marsh and Sarah. Um, there are a number of different questions coming through. So um, Sarah, if you don't pick them all up, um, if people aren't getting a response, feel free to just send us an email and happy to engage with you separately. Yeah, okay. likewise. Thanks for the attendees. I think it's been, been some very engaging uh, questions uh, throughout the back end and happy to let that run over. But thanks again to Sarah uh, and Mark for the opportunity. It's been a good session. Um, yeah, thank you, Mark and Ben. There's really, really good feedback. So thanks for today and we'll talk next week. Right. Cheers. Okay, bye. Bye, everyone.